thank you everybody for coming on today. Uh, we have um, an esteemed guest, uh, Bob McCurdy, is the president of GTI. Uh, you might know him from um, different lighting solutions, um, but a real first class outfit uh, that he runs and uh, really known for their, their high expertise in techn technical matters. So this is Columbia Omni's uh, interview series. Uh, we try to interview uh, experts that have knowledge of the textile world. And I welcome you and uh, appreciate you coming in. Bob, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Mitchell. It's nice to be here. And it wasn't a long commute. <laughs> that was good. Um, I guess, you know, I, I am going to ask you a softball question. You told me not to, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> what, um, what do you feel, um, just a basic answer, why does an apparel company need standardized lighting? Well, the answer is if they aren't concerned with uh, reproducing the design that they've come up with and they, they don't mind that there's variation in appearance and, and color shifting, then they wouldn't need it because that's what it's there for. So, uh, but I know that you have a designer and he gathers the creativity to come up with a color scheme that is going to be turned into a garment or a series of garments. And those colors are really critical to conveying the message and the feeling and variation in component colors uh, causes major you know, loss of the, the overall impact. So basically, if the, if the company cares about the quality of what they're doing and color is, is part of that, then they're going to have, you know, a lot of different tools to help them do that. But one of them is definitely going to be a light box because their eyes are simply the most sensitive and the highest level of testing about a color match and how colors work together, the harmony of two colors. Um, and the eyes connected to the heart capture the emotion of colors that, you know, measurements are great at putting numbers down, but, you know, it, it's people make a decision to buy, buy an outfit for the impact it has on their person and the what they see. And so um, if you're serious about quality and consistency, you'll have a light booth in there that, that helps you uh, control those two things. Yeah. Yeah, well, I agree with you. I think it's the first step to really starting to manage your color. Um, but I, I, well, I haven't been in the store for a while, but um, uh, being in the store and a lot of people, you know, a lot of walk-in uh, traffic and people would say to me, and I would get this often, Bob, and I'm sure you've heard this often, is that, um, hey, I could just walk, walk over to the window and, you know, there's my light. It's fine. It works. Why should I, you know, why should I bother? Actually, that's a good first start. You know, A, it's free. B, it's, it's daylight. And the only problem with it is that it's not there all the time. It's not there when you need it. It's not there in afternoons if the weather's bad. It's, it's actually, as opposed to kind of a fixed environment or, or condition to, to make a color judgment, it's, a, it's all over the lot. So it, uh, you know, inherently, Daylight is a great light source to, to judge color because it's got energy across the whole visible spectrum. And that's why the standard that uh, is used has a simulation of daylight because it's really the, the fullest way to see all the colors that are present in an in a object. But the real problem with natural daylight is its lack of consistency and it doesn't last 24 hours a day. So <laughs> it, it, it doesn't, uh, and it's, yeah. We can't control that, unfortunately. <laughs> You'd have to work up in Iceland or something. <laughs> exactly. Well, back <laughs> in the day, there was this thing called North Sky Daylight. And indeed, uh, you would have windows in, your, in the roof of your building oriented towards the north because that sun in the north sky was the most stable for the longest period of time in a, in a given day so that your quality control conditions for visual inspection were, were going to be best and held longest. And that was about a four hour period of time during the day. That was 7,500 is also kind of referred to as North Sky Daylight. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. What is metamerism and what is constancy? I think they get confused a lot, um, those two terms. And how would you define them? Well, there's actually different types of metamerism, um, but the one that 
comes to mind is the one that uh, is demonstrated by, I don't know if you can see that, but okay. this is, um, you know, that is what is called a metameric pair. And that's what happens when you've got two colors, or maybe you've got a, a sample and a target color, and you look at them and you say, ah, you know, that is a good match. I see a good, good visual agreement, and I think I've got a good match. And then you walk into a different lighting environment with a different spectral makeup, and that match disappears. It, they, the two colors move apart. And then you move into a different light source, and those two colors might move apart in a different direction. And the, the, the effect is called, it's a metameric color match when those colors will only match under a specific light source. And that's not uncommon when you're dealing with, you know, uh, pigments and uh, dyes, pigments, uh, plastics, when you're putting, when you're assembling a, a, a garment and you've got different components coming with different colorants in them. Um, this is the, that spectral curve shape you see, there's two, two curves there. And each one is the reflectance curve for the two sides of that, uh, the colors. And under a certain light source, under a nice balanced daylight source, they actually look like they're pretty darn close. But when you, and in fact, I'm sitting here and as I move away, I can see those colors kind of change. And part of that is what a camera does. You know, we, it's what our eyes do to that en energy, but a camera introduces its own sort of uh, uh, shading function. So it's hard to count on what you see in the camera, but metamorism is usually an, a bad thing because usually it means you approve the color and here comes the production run and it doesn't actually look like the color you approved. And, and so it can be very expensive if you, if you aren't testing for metamorism, which is why the standard for, you know, for textile testing includes multiple light sources with different spectral power distributions. So I was going to ask you about that. Is it, um, is D65, D65 is still the AATCC standard? It is. But you're saying that they also recommend a secondary and tertiary? Absolutely. Um, and they like, it, especially for the detection of metamorism, you want to have light sources that are very different spectrally. So if we start with D65, which is a, a very nice, flat, well-balanced, full color content, they call it a full spectrum light source, um, as a starting point. And that's an excellent starting point because Today, you might be working in, a, in, a, in the red area, and so you need a lot of detail, a lot of energy in the red to show you subtle differences. Tomorrow, you could be in the blue or green or orange, and a light source that, that has full color content is going to illuminate those segments of the, of the spectrum, allow you to detect shifts very quickly before they become a problem. So D65 or when you check for metamorism, which you typically do whenever you're doing a, a swatch comparison or a drawdown comparison, you will inspect mostly under D65 and then you will throw a switch and turn to uh, a store light, like a cool white fluorescent, which is about a 4100 Kelvin light source with a, well, it's changing over time, but traditionally it's been a, a, like a mountain in the yellow green area and then very little red energy. And then finally, you'll throw the switch to uh, tungsten light, or what's known as incandescent aluminum A. And that's a very low color temperature, about 2850 Kelvin, with a very high amount of red and very little blue. And if you have two colors that look like each other under all three conditions, then you have a very good color match because you've tested it with extreme spectral differences. Yes. So that's the reason why D65 is the primary, but Without those others, you are running a risk of, of having a color match that goes bad when you leave the, uh, the viewing right. environment. And constancy? Constancy is a definition of how a color will continue to appear to be that color as you move to different light sources. It, it sounds very, very similar to metamorism, but in fact, it's based upon a single color. And if you can imagine, um, you know, somebody gives you a, a, a tree bark and says, you know what, I, I love this, this color of this 
tree bark and I want you to recreate it. And so you might mix up several different uh, dye blends to recreate that. And the, the more uneven up and down the, the spectral reflectance of that blend is, the more susceptible it is to when you bring it from indoors to outdoors or daylight to your kitchen table, that brown moves red or it moves green. And so that brown that you like so well sort of goes away versus a reflection of the brown that's closer to the spectral reflectance of the actual material, which, has, uh, which is going to behave the way that, that original does. So that will be more consistent as you move around the world. And you think about a Christmas tree, they're always green. And, and part of the reason they're always green is because we know they're green. And, and we, our, our brain and our eye says that's green even if they're inside under a, an incandescent light bulb that's shining red light on them, um, those are like signature colors that you know. And so color constancy is a function of the color formulation that creates that dye. And there are formulations that are more stable and you can walk in and out of different lights and they're still gonna look the color that you want. And others that move from really good to like, there's no way that's the color I want because their spectral curve shapes are, are uneven. So constancy is consistency of color appearance. Good, that's a good definition. Um, why can't I just take a T65 bulb in a regular lamp and call it a day? Say, hey, that's, D that's D65, I'm good. Why do you I need could, a box? You could call it a daylight if you did. <laughs> Well, again, it, it depends on, on how critical you're looking at things. You know, for, for some people in some applications, that would represent a good starting point because it's definitely going to be better than a, a cool white fluorescent or, a, you know, an LED that's introducing a strong bias to color. However, when you are making color judgments and you're making fine, you know, fine comparisons and you're discussing this with other people in the production chain, you need to have consistency. So that lamp in a desk fixture is going to uh, illuminate different spectrally than that lamp in a controlled environment with the properly designed reflector and a, and a transmission lens and the correct uh, geometry and distance to the viewing area. So that in one case, you're basically making your whole process extremely consistent by having an environment that doesn't change and is very tightly matching the ASTM standard. In the other, you're taking a step towards having good controlled lighting, but you're, you're leaving it completely open to ambient conditions and the color of your desk and light that's coming in. So it's a, it's a big variable. It's very important because our eyes are so sensitive and we make lots of pretty major decisions. And we can either lock that in and have complete confidence that when I judge this here, my suppliers and uh, out in the West Coast or in other countries are seeing what I'm seeing, or there's room for variation. And so we may still be struggling with, yeah, but it looked a little too orange here, or it looked a little you know, darker. So the big reason is that the standard delivers a, a very strong set of benefits and biggest being consistency and communication capability. And a light in a fixture doesn't get you there. Yeah. So uh, talking about consistency, how do you know, how do you really know what your mills are using and if they're using uh, the same lighting that you are, that you prescribe to them? Yeah, there's, you know, one way is to make a color observation and then look at notes or make the observation, send it back and, and be discussing with them and realize that they don't see what you see. You know, there's that hunch that, gee, every time I, go back and tell them, here's what I'm seeing. They come back and, and we're obviously on a different wavelength. So there's simply over time, the realization that there's something missed, something's different about the way we're seeing things. The, the best way to do it is with an instrument. A spectroradiometer is the, the, uh, you know, the thing you, the industry likes you to use to test the lighting environment. And that will allow you to measure the, the, spectrum of your light, the color temperature, all the metrics that make up, you know, how well you replicate uh, D65, and then have that same measurement done at the mill and see, are you in sync or is there, are there differences in the way color is, is rendered? Um, 
GTI manufactures portable fold-up units that uh, are easily carried in, and, and sometimes that's what happens. It's a customer, you know, someone will go in and, and set it up and say, okay, here's, let's look, and everybody says, yes, I, we all agree on what we see. When we close that up and walk away, they no longer have that ability to, to know what you're seeing uh, in New York, and that's a big, that's a big problem, and, and a, a pretty darn inexpensive solution to that problem because, you know, light boxes are available in such a range of sizes and, and prices that it's a very small, you know, small investment to, to lock down one of the biggest variables that you're fighting in, in color production. Yeah. And is a, a spectro radio, radiometer, is it, that's, it's fairly expensive, right? Is that a, would yeah. that be a good thing for people to buy? It, no, I mean, yes for <laughs> us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I say that because spectroradiometers are sort of like spectrophotometers. You know, they, if you put two in a room together, one walks out the winter and one, you know, is lying on the floor. And why? Because they didn't agree. They, 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 uh, they don't always agree with one another. And sometimes you'll find you're chasing the tail of measurements as opposed to being able to trust the, the data you're getting. And, and spectroradiometry is a little bit like that. There are, there are instruments used in the printing industry that are very low cost, that are really spectrophotometers that you just turn over and put a little cap on and, and start measuring the light that's falling on the, on the copy. And those have been problematic because they give sort of erroneous information to everybody and then nobody knows what's right. So the spectroradiometer that you need is going to cost about five to $6,000 and it is good. And if you have a need and you have multiple places you view color, then it's a very good idea to, to have this kind of tool. Um, we actually were uh, started a service many, many years ago to go in and, and bring a radiometer and do these measurements to provide an auditing service to, to basically test, verify, certify, and solve problems that, that are causing the differences because you make decisions and they're, you know, they're quick and you're using your eye and your optical system. And if the light booth is wrong, your decisions are wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I know somebody in the industry that um, had gone into just a regular retail store, well name the name, and um, use a radio, a special radiometer to, you know, test different parts. It was you know, near windows, and mm -hmm. and um, she said there was probably about twenty different lights in the place, um, okay. which is amazing. Really, the the that's the challenge for retailers is uh, trying to see how can they define the retail lighting environment. And sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. If you're big enough, and you can. Then you can actually include as one of the lights that same uh, item, but most companies don't, you know, don't build their own stores and don't have that level of control. And if they're in a, in a, in a mall, they've got windows, they've got mall lighting. So that's, you know, it, it's almost impossible to, to do that. And that's where making sure you have a good match and it's not metameric lets you know that, you know, that, that, uh, outfit and, and that environment is going to look pretty darn close to what you want it to look like despite whatever lighting they're, they're throwing at it. Yeah. So that, that's a, a uh, you can go into a lot of different directions with that statement about retailers, you know, what, what do they use? How do they use it? But I guess on a more practical level is somebody's going to buy uh, a light box, you know, based on our conversation, because it was so um, awesome. Um, did, um, like what, what would you suggest that they put in a light box now, you know, a regular five light light box? The, you know, the basics are D65 and, you know, store light has traditionally been cool light fluorescent in North America and TL84 in Europe and Asia. And we have many customers in, in you know, South America and Asia that, that are serving both markets. And so they would like to have both because traditional cool white fluorescent had a different color appearance than TL84, even though they're both about 4,000 Kelvin. So for them, you need a D65 store lights, maybe a second store light, one North America, one European. Uh, Aluminum A or incandescent, uh, which is 
again, it's a screw and light bulb. It's becoming harder and harder to find due to uh, energy efficiency issues. It's being slowly legislated out of business. Um, we all look really good in incandescent. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a red light source and boy, we look, you know, I don't know, we, we look healthy under it. Um, so we generally like it. Um, and it's got a very, very unique spectral curve that's excellent at detecting a, a, a mismatch. So there's a lot of value in it. The other thing is, no matter where you are in the world, when you screw in a tungsten lamp and you apply power to a, a filament, you get the same spectrum. It's the most consistent thing, you know, going, given that their voltage changes and it may not be, you know, the same voltage, but that is a known that the industry and color matching uh, calculations and software has used uh, for decades. With LEDs slow uh, march towards replacing those for uh, efficiency purposes, you are faced with ultimately trying to figure out what do we use in place of, of that incandescent. And there's some things on the horizon, but really nothing stands out right now because that was more, that's a technology. And when you say, you know, an incandescent lamp is a light source that's correct, but it's a technology. It's a, it's a, it's electricity, you know, running through a, a, a filament. LED is completely different. It, it's whatever they decided to make. And trying to buy one six months from now that matches the one that I bought six months ago is a real challenge. So there's so much turmoil in LED manufacturing and design right now that there is no obvious clear choice to replace that, that tungsten lamp. That said, I would put an LED in that light box. Um, most likely it depends on who I supplied. Uh, there are certain manufacturers who have actually specified a specific LED um, that you, you know, if you do work for that company, you, you want to, you want that light source in the, in the booth. So, and then finally UV and UV is uh, UV can be used, you know, on its own or with other light sources, but it really, uh, tells you quickly if there's uh, a brightening agent in that in the uh, material that would cause you a problem down the road. It's better to know it early on, so you use it for testing, you know, incoming material testing and you know finished goods to see, for example, if you've got a zipper and it's got brighteners in the plastic. It's good to know it. Whether you can fix it, whether you can go back to your supplier and say, is there a a, a formulation that would reduce that? But knowing it's there is better than finding out it's there and your customer isn't happy with it. Right, yeah. So you, you mentioned LEDs. What, I know LEDs is on, you know, not everybody's mind, but it's, it's very important in this business. Um, it, has, it, has it gotten to a point where it's, it's that widely used, A, and is it, is it that different? I, I, I don't know if it's fully standardized yet. Actually, the, there was an effort to standardize LEDs, the CIE, the Commission Internationale de l'Eclairage. You have to be able to say that to be in this <laughs> Well, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, you know, they are the ones that actually create the standards that we all strive to, to match. So that those daylight specifications, D50, D65, D75, those are CIE illuminants and they are specified and toleranced and there's a lot of calculations and numbers that we all have to follow. They um, came up with nine LED sources that replicated sort of what what's out in the world right now and it took them a long time because it's a committee and uh, it involves lighting and they proudly you know finished the project and presented these nine um, LED sources. They weren't illuminants because they're not defined that way, but they were they were sort light sources. And when they published it, the next A squared meeting, they, they got together and found that they couldn't source four of them. So they had just come out with this, these, you know, quote unquote standards, and already almost half of them aren't can't be found. So huh. it just points to the nature of LEDs. They're they have a lot of promise and they're, they're, they're great to fit everywhere and anywhere. But in terms of when you need consistency, that's really where they, they aren't yet delivering. I mean, we've just recently come out with a, uh, a D50 LED, which goes to our printing and graphics market. And we're just starting to, to introduce that. Um, 
We don't have a D65 yet, that's in the plans, but getting the, the daylight balance and the UV is, is much more challenging and, and much more costly. So, you know, whereas LED, you think of as a low cost, you know, solution. LED daylight fluorescent is, well, fluorescent replacement is, is expensive. But we do think it's gonna deliver a positive return on investment to the user. So what is the advantage of using LED? The advantage in the sense of daylight, you know, to simulate the daylight, the advantage is going to be lower power consumption and longer, longer operating life. Um, you know, typically a daylight lamp in a, in a color critical application is recommended to be relamped at uh, 2,500 hours of use. Uh, an LED looks like a, at a minimum, it'll be 7,500 hours. So it'll be three times longer and, you know, possibly longer. It takes a long time to, to test a, a lamp for three year operation. Initially, when LED manufacturers brought products to the market, they were using calculations based upon initial burn time to tell you that that LED is gonna last 100,000 hours. And eventually they found out ah, there, there's things happen over time. The heat in there wears <laughs> down things. So then they came to 50,000 and I, I think they're down to 20,000 now. So there's somebody there's, stand there with a stopwatch. Exactly. <laughs> a long time to <laughs> test the lamp. Light. Now that's the kind of job for me. <laughs> um, what about halogens? Are halogens, uh, are they important? Are they going to be used? Actually, yeah, halogens are used. Um, they're, they, in fact, even, uh, even tungsten, we have shifted to a, you know, a halogen based lamp that has a, a, the same spectrum, but uh, is more energy efficient. Um, they, they allow you to see very good detail in the red and the warmer colors. So so for now, halogens, and then, and they are, they're, they're more efficient than a, than a straight uh, tungsten lamp. So, so for now, they kind of represent a, a, a good solution. Um, and there's, there's things going on in, in lighting technology that, that, I mean, I think I read at M MIT, they had, they had found a way to uh, harvest the lost energy of a tungsten lamp. It's it, all the energy that's lost is infrared or it's heat. And they actually built a collection system around the filament and, and directed it back in. And they, they found that they could get a lamp to last, you know, as long as an LED. So, mm. and, and be as efficient. That's fine in a lab by, you know, MIT guys. Whether that ever becomes commercially made, you know, time will tell. But there's things in, the, in lighting that, you know, kind of, mitigate the, the, the transformation. It's been a long, slow process of LED moving into areas where it is indeed the best choice. And right now for, for daylight, we're just starting with it and time will tell if it's indeed, you know, vastly superior or, you know, equal to and somewhat better. And what are, what I get, you know, if, you, if anybody wants to get really confused, all they have to do is go buy light bulbs these days, right? Because it's like, similar to 60 watts but it's 10 watts and all you know and it's what what is what should i be looking at if i should i be looking at for lumens lux foot candles or what is the it's typically lumens is what you'll find on the box um you know lumens is the light energy measured being emitted by a light source and typically when you're at a hardware store and you're buying you know looking at the different um LED or tungsten lamps, they will have a lumen output. So that's brightness. And they're going to take a, um, an LED and they're going to measure the brightness and say, this is equal to a 60 watt lamp and it uses, you know, seven watts or nine watts. And, and that really is the driving force behind uh, the shift to LED is because as compared to what an incandescent lamp does in terms of efficiently converting, you know, energy to light, um, an LED is vastly, vastly superior in terms of that efficiency. With fluorescence, it's, 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 it is better, but it's not anywhere near that same multiplier. It's probably, you know, a half or, you know, 40% less 
with the fluorescent comparison. So, so the savings from going from fluorescent to LED, they're still there for non-critical applications, but they're they're nowhere near as positive as the as the uh, incandescence. So lumens is the lumens is what you'll see that and color temperature, you know. And they and I will say that the the packaging has gotten very good at at showing you you know warmer, cooler, and and you think about it uh, that tungsten lamp that aluminum A is twenty eight fifty four or twenty eight fifty two or twenty eight fifty six. I think it's six. Those last six K really get me. But two thousand eight hundred and fifty six Kelvin, and so you'll go see an LED lamp and it's you know, 2,700 or 2,800. That's, when you put it in and look at it, you probably will not see it identically uh, to the warmth of a, of a uh, incandescent lamp, but it's, it's a lot warmer than what we started with, which was, you know, these really high color temperature, green, really unpleasant light qualities. And, and how does the color rendering index um, work with that? Is that a function of lumens or? No, lumens is quantity. So lumens is, you know, how bright. Uh, color rendering is how does it render a, a set of colors. And CRI or color rendering index is always a comparison of the light source that you're checking. You know, you have a light booth and you say, gee, what's the CRI of that light booth? It is gonna be a comparison of how well your light source renders these, it's actually eight, eight pairs of colors in the visible region. Um, as compared to a daylight source of within 100 Kelvin. So CRI is always a comparison to either, you know, either a daylight source or in the case of an incandescent lamp, it's actually a light bulb, a 100 watt light bulb is a, has a CRI of 100 because it's the basis for the calculation. But most daylight sources, you're comparing your D65 light source to CIE illuminant you know, D65 uh, of the same color temperature. So it, it, um, it's a great term. It has led to a lot of long conversations and it's a little bit flawed in terms of how it's calculated and how it, uh, it sort of doesn't favor, uh, it doesn't favor fluorescence much, but it definitely doesn't favor LEDs. So uh, I think the LED industry spent a long time trying to get higher CRIs and then eventually came up with another way of making that calculation called the color quality index, the CQI. So, but the concept of color rendering index makes perfect sense is, you know, how well does this render colors? And, and, and you do want to have a higher CRI if, if you have that option. Well, you would think like D65, because it has a, a more even uh, distribution of light, um, of the energy that um, that would be a higher CRI. It is, but it depends. CRI is always a comparison. So if I get a perfect um, match to a CIE D65, I might have a CRI of 100. Um, the standards basically say you need 90 or better. So, and anything above 90 has very nice, has really good color rendering. So, um, but, and then in terms of rendering the full range of colors, a daylight source is going to be far better than a, a incandescent or a store light, you know, cool white fluorescent or TL84. Yeah. So um, I just bought a light box. Um, nice. You know, going to use it and I'm going to be a really good boy about keeping my, you know, colors, you know, and I'm going to look at them in different light sources. But how do, how do I say, okay, this is my primary. What, you know, what goes behind that pick? Is it the stores that you work with? Um, is it the mills that you work with? Um, and, and say, this is my primary, this is what I'm going with, and? It's already been done. The, uh, the A squared, you know, AATCC uh, committee has established a, a lighting environment specifications for critical color assessment, color match assessment, because frankly, whatever you come up with, the value is vastly higher or vastly lower, depending upon if the guy you're talking to has that same standard. So rather than uh, say, you know, gee, what should I use? Let's think about that. Not that you shouldn't think about it, but first say, you know, what is the industry using and, and, and why are they using it? And what are the mills using and why are they using it? And I think you'll find that 
in almost 100% of the cases, if they do have a light booth, that light booth is designed to meet an ASTM standard that uh, is specified and certified by, by A squared to, that includes the daylight and includes the aluminum A and the store light and UV so that you can kind of plug into a, an ongoing worldwide lighting network as opposed to trying to start your own. And again, the, the, the difference is if you've got a retail customer who has enough control of their process and their uh, sales environment, that they can actually say, this is the light source that we would like to use. You know, for example, um, U30, you know, the Ultralume 30 became very, very popular. It had better color rendering characteristics than a, a cool white fluorescent. And so that became like a go-to light source for a lot of retailers. That lamp was actually discontinued. It was made by Philips and it was discontinued in 2009. And even today, 11 years later, you'll see it's still written into some store, you know, store specifications because A, it worked and B, there's replacements that are not U30, but they do a nice job of simulating the spectral characteristics of U30 so that you've got a nice 3000 Kelvin, you know, light source that renders color very comparably. That's called a TL83. But frankly, you know, there's the standard and then there's your key customers and a light booth that's going to do you the most good is going to combine those. Okay. What I, I see some um, light boxes now that have like internet connections and they're really, really fancy. What, what, why would you need an internet connection? Well, it's good if you got to watch a movie in between color. <laughs> Plug it in. <laughs> now the, the only, you know, the only reason, that comes to mind is if there's sensing built into the light box, you know, if there's a, if there's actually a, or maybe timing, you know, typically the, the viewing booths that we sell will have a, a lamp counter, a clock, an hour meter on each light source. So you'll know when it's coming up and when you should change those lamps to maintain consistency and compliance to the standard. That if you are using an internet connection, maybe there's a way to get that, you know, that transfer to, a home base. Um, we really haven't, you know, seen a great reason for it yet, but, you know, this is the age of IOT, right? The internet of things. And if it can plug into the internet, it must be more useful. <laughs> but frankly, it's, you know, sometimes the, the technology gets in the way of the function of a, a simple visual appraisal. So, so I don't know, we're, we have yet to see kind of where that delivers value to the, to the users. Yeah, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> I think there was some, um, you know, some quality controlling that you could do by, you know, linking into um, a box in Taiwan or wherever and see, you know, how it's running and what temperatures it's running and, and that kind of thing. But um, it seemed really limited. Yeah, I've seen it done in uh, applications, not, not in textile, but in graphics where somebody had uh, maybe 60 monitors that were used to for proofing purposes and they actually had you know sensors that they were measuring the, the colorimetry of the monitor and the luminance of the monitor and they could actually kind of see their network of monitors how how consistent they were but that that's rare and that's not you don't see a lot of monitors used in, in color comparisons and textile because it has a hard time simulating the texture and, and angular viewing of the materials and yeah it's just not yeah you know, it, it ha doesn't lend itself yet to, to that yeah i mean the people are trying that's for sure <laughs> yeah it would be nice i mean it's if uh if we could get a 3d printer on the customer's floor and just print up a product on it on demand that would be really right. nice but right. it doesn't it's not within the realm right now for almost all things so a light box, I, I generally think of a light box as being used at the, I guess, at the beginning of the of a color flow. Um, you know, somebody looks at that color, gets the submit back, and they're looking at it against the standard. Where, where else in the pro process, the color process, would they need to use a light box? Well, actually, the, you know, incoming materials inspection, you know, you, you can, you know, so you know, at the dyer, obviously the, the master batch or the, you know, the dye house, they need it. 
at the design they needed, as you said, at the beginning of the process. Um, and it is funny, the, there's, a, uh, there's a feeling that you know, a light box, that controlled lighting environment is going to somehow confine my creative capacity. You know, I, I don't want to be confined to, to working in, you know, in a, a single lighting environment. And yet that single lighting environment has multiple light sources in it and it does simulate daylight. So it's actually not com confining you to something. It's actually plugging you into, you know, other creatives and, and other, you know, providers because there's one international standard. So, so yeah, so incoming inspection, you know, product quality control kind of after the fact evaluation and then consistency of production because things can shift and you would like to make, you know, visual testing to make sure you're not, you're not out of a acceptable spec until you've got product that can't sell. So you were talking about geometry and distance from light. Is that saying that basically the, the way that you set up a light box uh, is important also, not just that you have the right lights in there and... Yeah, actually, so, as, as I mentioned, sometimes the, uh, the angle of illumination and angle of observation can affect what you see as far as a color match goes. So it's not unusual to put into a light box a 45 degree uh, stand that will hold samples at a specific angle. And in some cases, um, you might have, in the case of like effect coatings on paints, when you change the angle of illumination, those colors change rather dramatically. So we make a variable angle uh, sample stand that can be put into these light booths and then you can move that angle forward and back and, and observe whether you've got an angular uh, mismatch that takes place and if you can do anything about that. So the intensity, the uniformity, the surround condition, that, that gray surround in that light booth is actually doing something. It is blocking out ambient light and it's giving your eye a neutral benchmark to kind of stabilize and become, you know, reach a Zen-like state of color observation. <laughs> That's a very highly technical term, but it does actually put you in a better position to catch small color differences, which, you know, it's, that's where the, the, the value is because that smaller that difference, the, the less it's going to potentially cost to, to correct or diagnose. Yeah. When I think of the Zen like states, I think of the apparel business. <laughs> the Zen like states of America. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, you know, can you, this is just something that occurred to me the other day, is that can you um, test for light fastness under a light box? It has been used. There, there's, again, there's, um, there's A squared procedures that are, are spell out the process. And in that, in that process, there's a visual appraisal that takes place and that the lighting is specified. Now, light fastness is usually long-term exposure to, to daylight, so UV. And so there are, you know, there's aging systems that are super high UV energy, you know, capacity that you, you put the material in and, you know, come take it out the next day. And it's like it spent 10 years out on a, a rock in the Sahara. <laughs> Our normal viewing booths don't do that, but, uh, but indeed the industry does. And when you do take it back out, you go to the, the you know, the good old light box and you make your visual comparison to see how much did it move. And, and that's how you can compare different dye lots and also different substrate, you know, different materials. So yeah, yeah. it's, there is, as you know, A squared um, has been around a long time and has a lot of specifications. And, and it's, it's really impressive actually to see the books that we receive and, and we participate in some of those committees. Um, but they really go to great lengths to, to try to dial down so that when you need to test for some attribute of your, your product, there's a procedure there that um, is spelled out and, and is done in a very scientific method. Yeah. It seems like, um, you know, I, look, I'm, I'm really kind of peripheral to the apparel business, but when, um, when I was at Pantone, I was often asked, hey, when are you guys going to stop using D65? It's ancient. Nobody uses it anymore. 
and and it's still the you know a squared uh, standard. What uh, what would people prefer? You know, wh whatever their store lighting, you know, their big, biggest customer at the time. Right. You know. Right. Yeah, and the thing is, they should have that. But they, that's that's a it's a good question. But I think the answer is, you know, if you had to start to design a standard, and you said, well. I get jobs that I am involved with that rank color, you know, cover the range of colors. So I can't say I'm only doing work for Coca-Cola and I'm only doing red. I need to be ready for any customer. So what I need is a light source that has very, very good color rendering characteristics all across the spectrum. When I say that I am going to land on a daylight source because that's where they really excel. So, whatever light booth you have if it's quality control and if it's color evaluation you will have a daylight simulator in there now you might say well why not d75 they used to use d75 in the cotton industry um, <coughs> it is still used in the food and drug but by and large the key daylight for industry is is d65 <coughs> excuse me Okay, I have I have one one last question and then a a, a question for for from one of our listeners. But off your left shoulder, you have one of those um, neat devices that has three different um, three different light sources at once, and I just think that's the neatest thing. It, it shows so well uh, what a uh, how a color can change under different lighting. I get to talk a lot less when I have one of these. <coughs> so let's do this. Let me get rid of this daylight. <coughs> so basically what you're seeing is the reason why having a standard is so beneficial. If you can imagine three people trying to work together who aren't standing alongside each other and making color judgments, if they have different lighting environments, different light qualities, they are not going to see the same thing. And there's no way they can actually reach a good solid agreement on whether color is right or where to go with the color to make it right without that, that common lighting environment. So that is what we call a color rendition demonstrator. And it harkens back to um, Macbeth Corporation, which was located about a mile and a half from where I'm sitting and had a product they called it a color and light visualizer, smaller version of this, but it was the most powerful way for someone to understand that, you know, lighting uh, has such an impact on color that if you actually care about color, you have to care about lighting. Um, and the other, what that leads into is that, uh, 1975 by a former member of Macbeth, someone uh, who also was my personal founder. So my, my dad had worked at Macbeth for 15 years and left and started GTI. And so here we are in Newburgh, New York, uh, continuing the pursuit of excellence in lighting and color control. So, but that is something that I don't think will ever be replaced in terms of imparting why we're even having the conversation, why you'd have a light booth in your facility, because if you, if that wasn't the case, then uh, we'd be all making aluminum siding right now, Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> so tell everybody which three light sources those are. That's the same picture in three different light sources, correct? <clears throat> yes, it is. That is store light. So, and it looks a little uh, harsh right now, but so that's about a 4,000 Kelvin light source that uh, has a lot of yellow energy in it and, and very little red. And so you can, I'm not sure if you can actually see it or not. It gets a little better. But basically you look at her skin tone and you see, you know, there, she looks pale and minus red and that's what the light source is. And then on the right hand side or the opposite side, you've got an incandescent lamp and that's that tungsten aluminum A that's uh, 2,850 Kelvin. And it's actually, it's a very comfortable light. We all are happy in it. Um, it's got lots of energy in the red, but very little in the blue. So if you look at that image, you see you lose details in the, in the blue background 
uh, under that illumination and therefore you're not seeing the whole picture. The one in the center is a daylight that um, is actually 6,500. It's a hard one to replicate because it's such a small compartment. So that's a lamp that's actually not one of ours. So it's not as good as our daylight, but it does simulate and have a color temperature of, of 6,500. And so you can see, you know, if you're not controlling the light, you're, you're really risking uh, the color and your ability to communicate about color. Yeah, that's just a great example. Uh, I, yeah, that's I taught, a, taught a few classes um, and I just, I wish that I had that with me. So I will say this, this is what's called, we call it a metameric card. And it has an explanation on the back, which basically explains why those colors do what they do. And on the front, it has a story and then it has the two colors. And if people are interested, we'd be happy to send them one of these and they can impress their friends at cocktail parties. <laughs> That's right. Um, local experts on metamorism. My kids always thought I was doing a magic trick. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I am. Yes. And um, so the last question is from one of the uh, audience. It's, it's from uh, T.C. Uh, Mine, who I, I probably mispronounce her name every time I say it. But she's asking, are we moving into LED lighting totally? Uh, the, 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 without a time frame, it's hard to say, but I would say if you, if you can stretch time, you know, if, you, if you're not going to put a time limit on it, then probably, yeah, ultimately, but it's, it's, it's a long, slow process. There's just, there's certain applications and segments that, that LEDs aren't doing right now, but ultimately I think they will. I think there's efficiencies in manufacture and there's efficiencies in design that, that say that, yeah, eventually, you know, we'll be, we'll be all LED or all OLED. And, uh, but how soon that is, I don't know. That's, that's, uh, that's a big question and, and it'll, it's going to take, it's going to take some time, but yeah, yeah. I'd say yeah. yes. So another question is from Lisa Dennis and she asked, do you know if there are LED bulbs that will fit into an existing Great Tech Macbeth Spectralight three boxes? That is a three foot uh, lamp that goes in there. And at the moment there aren't for daylight. Uh, there are for other sources, you know, for like right now, um, LED is that are used in certain retailers. You should be able to find a, an LED lamp that is an installable there. Now that light source, that light booth has uh, ballasts in there. So, you can buy a tubular LED that just plugs right into the same slot that your fluorescent lamp comes out of. You just have to make sure that you know, will it run on the ballast that's in that light source? Or as in the case of our new D50 LEDs, you actually have to bypass the ballast. So you have to do a little bit of wiring in there to, to let the LEDs run directly to voltage. So uh, the answer is depending upon which LED you're after, there's probably one in there uh, that capability exists, but you may need to do a little homework to see if you have to bypass the ballast or if you can put a, a, a direct plug in, which, which they have those out there for non daylight LED. Okay, neat. Okay. Um, just a quick summary about where your career path, how did you get here? Um, I think you've been here for quite a while. Yes, I, uh, I have. It's longer than I thought. I can't believe <laughs> it's gone so fast, but it's good. It's been fun. Um, again, just as I mentioned, the, the company being started by my dad, um, I became involved with the family business, you know, pretty early on and mm. stayed. I don't know how I managed that. But uh, I actually did enjoy, uh, and, and it's funny because being in Newburgh, you know, we had Macbeth here and Macbeth was a, a early pioneer and very heavily involved with lighting and color measurement. And, and they now ultimately merged with X-Rite. Um, but for the longest time, you know, standard lighting and Macbeth were synonymous and Newburgh was where it came from. When GTI started in the mid seventies, after a lot of work, 
Newberg still stood for standard lighting, but now you had Macbeth and you had GTI. So you had a, a good, you know, competitive environment and, and lots of hard work going on. And um, so I worked with a lot of people that had been with Macbeth because, you know, they might have shifted gears, but they had a lot of knowledge. So, so we enjoyed a lot of benefit uh, of having people with tremendous backgrounds in, in lighting and color control come to GTI who had been with Macbeth. And so I learned from them, but basically I have done the same thing since I started. And I guess I won't stop till I, I get good at it. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. Um, it's just a fantastic job. Uh, it's uh, really interesting stuff. And I know that I learned a lot. I'm, I'm sure that everybody else did too. And uh, really appreciate your time and uh, all your effort. And for the audience, if you think of questions that uh, come up, you could certainly email me or the Facebook page and we'll send them Bob's way for you. Um, and uh, keep, tune, keep in tune. We'll uh, probably have some more uh, interviews pretty soon. And um, I'll introduce those and announce them uh, along the way. So um, this is Columbia Omni Studio. And thank you for attending our interviews with uh, industry experts. And Bob, I really appreciate it. Um, it was really, uh, it was a really illuminating. <laughs> My pleasure. Hey! Good one. <laughs> I was working on it. Okay.